What's up you guys, Dr. Gooden back with another lecture this time about aerobic training methods and in particular different types of training methods that you can incorporate into your aerobic endurance programming. Dr. Gooden here back with another lecture. I'm Dr. Jacob Gooden, professor of kinesiology, and in this video, we're going through the second half of chapter 20 from the essentials of strength, strength, <coughs> strength, excuse me, the essentials of strength training and conditioning textbook. We'll be talking about different types of aerobic training, as well as some special factors related to aerobic pro programming, such as altitude training, detraining, etc. Now, all of this info comes from the NSCA's textbook, Essentials of Strength Training and Conditioning. This chapter was written by Dr. Reuter and Dr. Dawes. Okay, in this table, table 20.4 from the text, we see some different categories of endurance training workouts. Okay, we see long, slow distance, pace slash tempo work, interval training, high intensity, interval training, and fartlek training. Now we'll go through each of these in detail in this lecture, um, but notice that in this table it gives you just a helpful little description as far as frequency, duration, and intensity goes for each of these. Long slow distance is going to be the lowest in intensity, but probably the highest in duration. We have pace or tempo training, which is the next uh, lowest in intensity, so we up the intensity a little bit. This is working on lactate threshold, um, or maybe a pace slightly below or above. Uh, it lasts only for 20 to 30 minutes. We go down to interval training, and this is where we start to break training up into bouts of work and rest, so work to rest uh, intervals, so that we can uh, train at higher intensities for longer, because if you just do a continuous higher intensity interval, well, you're gonna get tired and exhausted really quickly. If we give rest periods, then we can continue training at these high intensities. So we have traditional intervals and then high intensity interval training, or HIT training with shorter, uh, higher intensity intervals. And then finally, fartlek training, which is a fun sort of silly word to say, at least when I was in high school and I heard it, I giggled. Um, it's Swedish, I think it's Swedish, is it Swedish? I think it's Swedish, um, and it means speed play. Okay, and this is more of an unstructured training paradigm that a lot of aerobic endurance athletes use. So, long slow distance training. This is training uh, at a distance greater than race distance, Typically, unless you're a marathoner, then you do a lot of long, slow distance that is probably not greater than race distance. Um, it can be between 30 minutes up to two hours. Really anything less than 30 minutes is not necessarily long, slow distance. It might be slow distance if you're going slowly, but it's not long. Uh, it can also be over two hours though, but most of it, 90% of it, is gonna be between 30 minutes and two hours. The intensity should be less than 70% of VO2 max. Adaptations from this type of exercise, they include the body's ability to clear lactate. It's important to know that almost any training pace, like right up to uh, and even slightly over your lactate threshold, any of, running at any of those paces or exercising at any of those paces will enhance the body's ability to clear lactate in some meaningful way. I mean, if, if you're completely detrained, even standing up and going for a walk will enhance your body's ability to clear lactate. Is LSD training the best? Uh, way to uh, improve your lactate dynamics? Probably not. Probably want to go push more into that tempo slash threshold training category, which we'll see here in a second. Um, one, uh, another important adaptation is that this type of training causes a shift of type 2X fibers towards type 1 fiber. So we may not undergo a complete change in that muscle fiber, but at least our fast twitch fibers start to develop slow twitch fiber capabilities, more aerobic enzymes, smaller, uh, more mitochondria, all of that kind of stuff. Now it's important to know though that too much long slow distance training, especially if it's slower than the speed that you're going to be running or swimming or moving in your competition, too much of it can actually lead to decreases in performance. And in fact, we see this in a lot of base, uh, sort of the base period of training in the macro cycle of endurance athletes. They're their actual ability to compete at race speed might be depressed or go down, be suppressed <laughs> during a period of base building where they spend a lot of time at long, slow distance. As a coach, I think it's really imp important to incorporate not only 
the distance and volume training during the base period, but also injections of neuromuscular type training like hill sprints and, and some very low intensity plyos and weight training during that base building phase so that we're not completely neglecting all of those neural qualities that will help to develop speed later. Um, and and do, doing those things can help to counteract all of the long slow distance that the athlete's doing. It may not make them perform like super well right at the end of the base period. You still need that transmutation phase where now we're getting more and more race specific, um, but it will give you the foundation for those qualities much later. That's not included in the text. That's just a little gold nugget from yours truly. Now the next style of training to talk about is pace or tempo training. More often it's called tempo training. I would say, especially in the running community, you might also hear it described as threshold training. Threshold training is much more specific. This is running probably right at or very slightly below your lactate threshold, that inflection point at which the body starts to generate a ton of lactate more than it can use. But training at or slightly below this is threshold training. Training in that general vicinity is tempo training. So you could train a little bit slower if you want a more extensive tempo workout, train a bit faster if you want a more intensive tempo workout, maybe even train over it at uh, in an interval style workout so that you can run closer to race speed. If you are running a faster race, let's say a 5K or a mile or a 3K, then your, your race pace will hopefully be faster than your lactate threshold pace. And so maybe training faster than the lactate threshold or at, at a higher out power output but with periods of reduced intensity can help your body generate that lactate and then clear it and then generate and clear it. And this can also improve your lactate dynamics. Now, traditionally though, this is steady, uh, steady running for 20 to 30 minutes uh, continuously at the lactate threshold. You can also do that intermittent tempo training that I talked about. So series of shorter intervals with brief recovery periods. Emphasis on brief because you don't want to allow the body to fully recover. You just want to recover enough to bring that lactate back down to a sufficiently low point that you can run the same interval again. The objectives of this type of training are to not only develop a sense of uh, race pace, if your race pace is around lactate threshold, um, but also to enhance the body's ability to sustain fast paces and deal with the effects of that pace, so to deal with the lactate that's generating, and to improve running economy and improve your lactate threshold. The next style of training is interval training. And in the textbook, um, and in most textbooks, this is defined as exercise at an intensity close to VO2 max for intervals of three to five minutes. I would say that's a specific subset of interval training. That's like VO2 max or aerobic power interval training. You can use intervals for all manner of energy systems training, not just to improve your aerobic power. Um, but in this case, that's, that's the definition. Work to rest ratios should be about one to one. So if you're doing, let's say the classic milers workout of 10 by 400 meters at mile race pace, which is a little bit faster than VO2 max, uh, the rest interval for those tends to be about 60 seconds. That's like, I don't know, that's sort of the mythical mile workout. If you do 10 by 400 meters, uh, whatever that uh, pace you're running for those 400 meters, that's about the pace that you should be able to run your mile race in. And that's a good example of this style of training. Um, this allows athletes to train at intensities close to VO2 max for a greater amount of time. Injecting those rest intervals allows you to accumulate more training at those paces. It's the same reason why if you are going to go into the weight room and you're going to squat, you do three sets of 10 or three sets of five or, you know, 10 sets of, you know, two or three, whatever it is for the day. You don't just do all your reps in a row, right? If you go and try to back squat for a set of 30, like you're not going to walk out of that squat rack at the end of the workout. Having the rest, breaking it up into sets is important. Now, interval training should be used sparingly and only when training athletes with a firm endurance, um, a firm aerobic endurance training base. And what this means is that we shouldn't just get our athletes into shape by interval training year round, or at least not super highly intense interval training year round. And a lot of coaches even only prescribe VO2 max style training for their middle distance and distance athletes for about four to six weeks at a time, uh, because really after that, we start to see uh, maybe a plateau or staleness uh, happen. And you wouldn't want to start a program with that. You definitely want to build up that aerobic base and work capacity while working on the neuromuscular components that I mentioned a second ago, and then transition 
into more race specific and then VO2 max uh, type work like interval training as described here. Now we also have high intensity interval training and this is used, I would say, across sports now and it's really in vogue and it came into vogue about 10 or 15 years ago when I was maybe sitting in your shoes. If you're an undergraduate, I remember talking about uh, one of those first articles, um, the Tabata article that came out. And you know, it was all the rage. Oh, you can get in just this, you know, this uh, crazy workout in in a quarter of the time by using high intensity interval training. And you know, no doubt there are really good benefits from HIT training. However, I would say for purely uh, aerobic endurance athletes, like real runners, real cyclists, real s swimmers, we can't get away with just HIT training. A lot of people sort of think that you can, you can't. You can improve the, the general fitness parameters of general populations or maybe team sport athletes or um, CrossFitters or, or these other types of athletes that don't have um, highly mode specific um, competitions, right? Like if you're a runner, you shouldn't just do HIIT training because you need that extensive um, ability to continue to maintain that pace and, and the stamina and the, and the mitochondrial biogenesis that comes from that and the in enhanced blood volume of, of big volumes of aerobic work. You can't get away with just these five to 10 minute HIIT training workouts, okay? So rant over, let's describe what they actually are. HIIT training uses repeated high intensity bouts interspersed with brief recovery periods. So you're not allowed to fully recover in between. You need to go again before you're recovered. Athletes need to spend several minutes above 90% VO2 max for an optimal stimulus. An example of longer interval HIIT training is around two to three minutes at 90% VO2 max with a relief bout of less than two minutes. Okay, so we see that the relief bout is shorter than the work bout and that the working bout is above 90% VO2 max. We see HIIT uh, training or high intensity interval training in all aspects of training now where you could do it on a bike, you could do it on a track, you could do it, um, you could even do it swimming. You could do it with different exercises like kettlebell swings or a combination of exercises like maybe goblet squats and chin ups and mountain climbers and burpees and you mix those together with um, you know, maximal intensity bouts of each of those with some rest. So it's a great way to stay fit, but maybe not the most uh, sport specific way to train our aerobic endurance athletes. The next style of training is fartlek training. Again, this is a funny word, which in another language, probably Swedish, means speed play. And you can either have an unstructured fartlek or a structured fartlek. Both of them are great. Unstructured fartlek just means you send your athletes out for a run or on the bike. I don't know if they do it in swimming. Maybe they do it in swimming. Uh, but you send them out for a run and it's a steady run of a certain duration. And you say, hey, whenever you feel like it, uh, I want you to do a sprint or I want you to do an acceleration. And it can either be totally up to them, like they run fast to the next light pole, or if it's a group of athletes running, you know, they see how long they can keep up with the car that goes by them, or they try to beat the cyclists that they come around the corner and see, or they run fast when they're running by a group of particularly attractive people of the opposite sex, you know, to impress them, whatever it is. Um, they're just kind of playing around with their speed and it's continuous and it's fun. So it encourages changes in pace, acceleration, it encourages them to continue running at just that steady pace after they finish the speed bout, so their body's dealing with the after effects of increasing the speed. It's just a great way to increase the intensity a little bit of that training session and to have it be fun. You can also have a structured fartlek workout, which honestly some of the most grueling workouts I ran in college were very difficult fartlek workouts where our coach uh, gave us a prescription, and I'll try to think of one off the top of my head, let's say an example would be um, eight bouts of one minute hard effort plus 30 seconds very hard effort with about two minutes or maybe three minutes in between bouts. Okay, so that's 90 seconds of work, uh, double that for the recovery bout, but we're still having to run at you know seven minutes per mile pace, a steady clip in between, and eight sessions of those on the hilly roads around Westmont College where I went, that was super challenging. That was like really hard, and I remember by the last you know six, seven, eight uh, repetitions of that, like I was I was dying. It was very tough. So fartlek can be fun and easy and unstructured, or it can be highly structured and potentially very very challenging. The key point here is that the various types of training induce different physiological responses. And a sound training program should incorporate all types of training into the athlete's weekly, monthly, and yearly training schedule. It doesn't mean we incorporate all of them every week. We should have a phasic and structured program 
that is getting more and more sports specific as we go and we dose the athletes with different amounts of each of these at different points. Now, before we transition into specific program design applications, I, I do want to say that's not all of the different training types that are available to a coach who is working with aerobic endurance athletes. Of course, you also want to do things like hill sprints and sprint training and weight training and plyometrics, all these other um, very important supporting things that help to support aerobic endurance performance. But as strength coaches or future movement professionals, future sport coaches, I know you guys already know that since you're here on this channel, trying to improve your coaching game. All right, let's move into applications of program design um, according to different training seasons. Okay, so in the off season, this is what we call base training. We want to begin with long duration and low intensity. So that's where that LSD comes into play, not not the LSD you're thinking of. Remember, this stands for long, slow distance. We gradually increase the intensity and to a lesser extent, the duration. So what this looks like over time is that volume kind of goes up and stays high and then eventually comes down. Intensity slowly goes up, 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 up like that. This doesn't mean, like I said before, that we neglect all other components. We just merely de-emphasize them. But I think it's very important to build up other portions of your base, not just your aerobic base, but what about your neuromuscular base? What about your strength base? What about your base of resiliency? So like tendon strength and um, your ability to protect your joints. And what about your um, addressing any biomechanical factors with your stride? All of these things set you up for a really good season. You can build that pyramid much higher if you have a multifaceted base than just an aerobic base. When I see athletes just working on their aerobic base, but there's a bunch of other glaring deficiencies, I wonder like, okay, is your coach considering holistically all these other factors of training that will definitely impact you down the road? Or are they just thinking, oh, I'm gonna turn this athlete into an aerobic monster and that will overcome all of the other weaknesses. You know, an aerobic monster who doesn't have weaknesses is much better than an aerobic monster who does have weaknesses. So don't forget about those things. Then in the preseason, we focus on increasing intensity. So we get more into maybe some tempo training, maybe some longer cruise intervals, uh, maintaining or reducing the duration of training. So maybe we're not doing the super, super long runs anymore. Maybe we have a slight reduction in mileage. If you're a 10K runner and up, probably not a reduction, but 5K and down, probably a reduction or slight reduction in mileage. Depends on the type of runner you are. And that applies to the other aerobic disciplines as well. In season, this is during the competition phase, the program should be designed around the competition. Okay, so figure out what your key, key competitions are. Make sure that the athlete is not training through those key competitions. And if you're identifying other ones that are of lesser importance, they can train through those. We need low intensity and short duration, duration training just before race days. That doesn't mean you do super hard interval training the day before, but it does mean in the days leading up to the race, maybe you're not gonna send your athletes on a 15 mile long run right before they have you know, some big invitational the next day. Instead, we want maybe short little doses of high intensity training, um, like running economy intervals, which I like to prescribe, uh, which are intervals at race pace, but with sufficient recovery so that they're not impacting fatigue too much, but they are getting that athlete ready neuromuscularly and psychologically to deal with the paces that they're going to hit in the race. Um, when we go to the postseason, okay, this is after the championship is over, the last meet is done, we want to focus on recovering from the competitive season and maintaining sufficient fitness. So, you know, don't just take two months completely off and sit on the couch doing nothing. We need to maintain some level of athleticism and fitness, uh, but it probably shouldn't be structured training. Maybe continue training, two, three, four, five days a week, but in an unstructured manner, maybe uh, do some yoga, do some Pilates, go to a few CrossFit classes, as long as you don't hurt yourself um, and have, you know, maybe have the mechanics in those movements to support that. Whatever it is, it should just be fun and get the athlete back to being ready to say, hey, like I'm ready to hit training hard again. The key point is that sound year-round aerobic endurance training programs should be divided into sports seasons with specific goals and objective, objectives designed to improve performance gradually and progressively. So it's the same as any other training program. We wanna logically and in an evidence-based way prescribe different dosages of specific exercises and techniques and uh, training types to have the athlete not undergo overtraining, but to 
arrive at their primary competition in peak physical condition. Now, some issues related to aerobic training. The first is cross-training. Uh, when we say cross-training, this is a mode of training that can be used to maintain general conditioning in athletes during periods of reduced training uh, due to injury or during recovery from a training cycle. Uh, what this means is like maybe you have a runner and they have a strained calf and they can't go out and run. Well, maybe you can put them on a bike and the bike at least maintains their aerobic fitness and perhaps some aspects of neuromuscular um, fitness, right? A high cadence on the, on the bike, etc. But it doesn't hurt their calf, so they can continue to train. I personally have spent a long time, a lot of time, in the pool just doing deep water pool running, which absolutely is so boring and mind-numbing, but it it actually, it honestly got me into really good shape before running some very fast times in the mile in college. Yes, I had a, a really good aerobic base going into that. I had a decent amount of speed work going into that. Uh, I forget what my injury even was, but I was in the pool for three weeks and I maintained all of that fitness, got out of the pool and ran 351 at the Oxy Invite. I forget which year it was. Uh, but, but I felt amazing after that. I felt really good after that time in the pool. So cross training can absolutely maintain or perhaps maybe even improve some aspects of fitness for your athletes. Um, it's a good idea if you have athletes who are prone to injury or if you want to get more volume um, of aerobic training, but maybe less pounding for your athletes if they're runners, it's a good idea to maybe have one day a week be in the pool or on the elliptical or on the bike. Um, also just to, to mix things up because increasing the variety uh, of their training is a good thing. Runners just spend a long time, endurance athletes in general, just spend a lot of mode specific time in their discipline and getting them into another mode of aerobic training can be a good thing. The other thing is detraining. Detraining occurs when the athlete reduces the training duration or intensity or stops training altogether due to a break in the training program, injury, or illness. So absolutely, just like any other fitness characteristic, um, there is aerobic detraining that happens when you stop training. Luckily, aerobic endurance actually stays around for quite a long time. It's similar to strength in that we can hold on to it for a long period of time. So you take a week off of running and you still have everything that you stored up. Maybe you feel a little flat, maybe neuromuscularly, you know, you don't have that same tension, tautness in the muscles to, to allow your running economy to be optimized, but that, that can be fixed with one or two days back running, some, you know, barefoot strides, a couple faster intervals, and you're good to go. Longer than two weeks though, and then we start to see um, a slight drop off in aerobic capacity. The next thing to talk about is tapering. How do we taper our athletes? I recently had a discussion with um, a track coach who emailed me. We were talking about the benefits of tapering, how to taper their athletes. And it's, this is actually one of the uh, points of contention in the literature. There are some people who, uh, such as Coach Steve Magnus, who I greatly admire and love reading his stuff, and Coach John Marcus, and they have a great podcast. They talk about how you know the traditional model of tapering, a lot of that research is done not with well-trained runners or elite runners, but it's done in other athletes altogether or even in non-athletes. Um, so how do we know that it necessarily applies to runners? And a lot of times you can run into this situation where if you drop the volume during the taper, by the way, I didn't define taper. Tapering is a systematic reduction of training duration and intensity combined with an increased emphasis on technique work and nutritional intervention. The objective of tapering is to attain peak performance at the time of competition. So the theory is that you, by reducing the volume of training but increasing the intensity, now fatigue dissipates, preparedness comes through, everything is sports specific and at high intensities, and then the athlete performs at their absolute best. But the thing is, that's what we've seen in the liter literature in some instances, but not all of it is applicable to runners. And often we get into the situation where we as a coach, execute the perfect or what we think is the perfect taper, okay? But then the athlete suddenly loses faith in the program or doesn't feel like they're training enough or starts to feel slow and then they perform slow, right? Feel slow, perform slow, feel fast, run fast. It's not a perfect science. That's why coaching is not just science, it's also art. It's the art and the science of coaching. Traditionally, we have stepwise tapers. We have, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? exponential tapers where you drop off a lot quickly and then you slowly taper off how much you're dropping uh, whereas intensity ramps up. If you want further information on tapering, look into Dr. Mujica's work on it. Now, although the nuances of tapering are debated, the principles of tapering such as 
reducing the training load at least a little bit and keeping intensity high and very sport specific those things are those things are key and that applies to almost no matter what type or level of athlete that you're coaching also concerning resistance training and aerobic endurance performance Research is still somewhat limited. We're growing in the body of research that we have looking at concurrent training and its benefits for aerobic athletes. But uh, there is da data to suggest that benefits can be derived from performing resistance training during aerobic endurance training. Like not at the exact same time, not like running with weights, but I mean like in, in a season of aerobic endurance training, also resistance training along the way. Benefits may include improved short-term exercise performance, so if you have an 800 meter runner, heck yeah, they're gonna benefit from having stronger muscles and more powerful muscles. Uh, faster recovery from injuries. Specifically, resistance training can improve things like hill climbing, which requires uh, greater strength and power. Bridging gaps between competitors. So let's say someone makes a break for it, you can quickly accelerate and cover that gap. And the final sprint or the kick at the end of the race. If you have improved your motor unit recruitment pool that's available through strength training, right? Maybe you're not growing your muscles because you don't have the protein intake to support that because you're using all of it for that turnover um, of protein in the muscle, just recovering from endurance training. But let's say that you've now improved your ability to access high threshold motor units. Well, at the end of the race, even when you're tired and then you kick it into gear, you suddenly have all of those fast switch muscle fibers at, your, uh, at the ready, at your availability. You just need to call on them in that final kick. A lot of runners can't access that until they undergo some form of ballistic or high force strength training. And lastly, altitude. Now altitude is defined as anything from 500 meters to 5,500 meters above sea level. Um, acclimatization, that's the ability to, um, to undergo physiological adaptation to the current climate. Uh, acclimatization may occur between 12 and 14 days at moderate altitudes up to 2,300 meters. Uh, but it can also take up to several months. So it can take longer than that in order to acclimate to uh, that altitude. Specifically for endurance athletes, in order to see an ergogenic or, or performance enhancing effect, Athletes need a hypoxic dose of at least 12 hours or more per day um, for a minimum of three weeks at moderate altitude. So I remember in college, we would, our cross country team would take this trip up to Mammoth. And we'd be at altitude, but we were usually only there for one to two weeks. And so really that amount of time, probably for most of us, didn't incur any type of physiological change over and above what we would have been experiencing at sea level. Now, we've gone over this in previous videos, but remember that the best uh, probably the best um, altitude training regimen is to live high, so to live at altitude and to train low. So you come down the mountain to do your training so that you get the ergogenic effects of living at altitude, but you can get the performance enhancing effects of being at sea level where now you can sustain faster tempos, faster paces during your running. So neuromuscularly, you're getting a better effect down at sea level, whereas cardiovascularly, you get those effects of living at, at altitude. Okay, guys, that's it for this chapter. Hopefully you stuck with me through all of those rants about different types of training. And as I said in a previous video, there's gonna be a lot more of this type of content on this channel, specifically related to strength training and endurance training. What happens if you wanna train both? What if you're a hybrid athlete? What are some tips for programming both strength and endurance at the same time. So stay tuned for more of that. If you have questions about this, ask me down in the comments below and I'll see you guys on the next video.